a shout and dance to you yeah. For you have been my help from now to live stand to your feet as we declare what we believe and we know that when we pray miracles happen when we pray God answers us God sees your need he knows who you are and he is ready to intercede on your behalf Father, high above, 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 high
you would bind up our own selfish will that is coming out of our flesh, that your will will reign, reign supreme, that your ways would be above our ways, that your thoughts would be above our thoughts, and that you would allow us to do that, to walk in that, God. We want to walk in your will. We want to walk in your way. God, we ask that you would set the way before us, that we can live in a way that honors you, that pleases you with our speech, with our hearts, with our minds. Bless the things that our hands touches. Bless the things that our eyes see. Bless the people around us, God. Fill us up that we would bubble over and reach the lives and touch the lives of our families and our friends. God, allow us to be the light and not just see it in our word and not just see it in your presence, but to be it, God. Allow us to be you with flesh on it, that we would be able to minister to those we come in contact with, that we would be able to be a blessing and not a hindrance, that we would be able to lift up and not tear down. God, we ask that you would be in charge. We ask that you would be over us, God, and we want to be submissive to you. Lord, that is our desire. God, we pray for heaven right here on earth. We ask that your kingdom would be present here on earth, that as they worship you in heaven, so we worship you down here. As we elevate you in heaven, so we elevate you down here. As we call you God over all in heaven, we do the same down here. God, we love you and we lift your name. God, we honor you and we lift your name. God, we bless you and we lift your name. All God's people say amen. sanctuary we love God don't we yes. amen for those of you that are watching I know I can't hear you respond but we love God don't we amen. praise God yes we do this is the day that the Lord has made we should rejoice and be glad in it amen. hallelujah amen. hallelujah so on behalf of our our pastor pastor Thomas and uh, the leadership of this church we want to welcome you those that are coming in and joining us for the first time, we say welcome. We appreciate you coming in and joining Lighthouse. We want to extend our personal thanks for you just taking out the time to worship with us this morning. Um, we have a few announcements this morning. The first announcement is 201. Does anybody know what 201 is? Yeah. <laughs> According to Sam, it's just class 201. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's discovering our spiritual material maturity or discovering my spiritual maturity. Here's the deal, okay? We want you guys to, to join all of our classes that we put out here at Lighthouse, but there is a little bit of a prerequisite. That prerequis prerequisite is that you go to the previous class first. So if we're hosting 201 today, that would mean that you would had to have gone to which class first? 101. 101, thank you for those of you that are in the sanctuary and understand that it is necessary for each one of us to go through 101 before we get to 102 or, one, or uh, 301 and, and 401. Does that make sense? Amen. Yeah, I, I think it does. Listen, I want to strongly encourage you. 
even if you've been coming here for a while and you're comfortable and you haven't been to any of these classes, one of the ways that you can be actively involved with what we've got going on here is to get into these classes. We want every member of Lighthouse Church to go through all four of these classes. So if you have not been to 101, even though we're launching 201 today, excuse me, um, you'll have an opportunity in two weeks to take 101, okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so join us today at 2 o'clock from 2 to 5 online, um, and it, it's very easy to get there. Get there. Go to lighthousesj.church, go to events, and then it puts you right into where we need to be. But before you even do that, you have to register. It's simple. Very, very easy to do, and then you can join the class. But once again, what is the prerequisite? What class do you need to take? 101. So today, if you're here at 201 at 2 o'clock, I would have expected that you've already been through 101. Amen? All right, for other announcements, Wednesday night Bible study. Has anybody, who joins us on Wednesday night? Just by a show of hands. Amen. Okay, praise God for you. For those of you that have not come, I'd like to formally invite you to Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock, also through Zoom. Easy to access. Just go to our, our website, hit uh, Wednesday night Bible study, or, or Bible study, and you're there, okay? I think that's it for our announcements, is it? Yeah. All right. Well, praise God. Would you stand to your feet and continue to worship with us together? Hallelujah. Bible says that the Lord God is mighty. He is mighty in battle. He's mighty to save. He's mighty to heal. He's mighty to set free. He's mighty to be everything we need him to be and everything we don't even know we need him to be. That's how good and amazing our God is. That God is big enough to handle right where you are. He's big enough to handle COVID-19. He's big enough to handle unemployment. He's big enough fear. He's big enough to handle race issues. He's big enough to handle everything. Amen. Do we believe that our God is a mighty good God? Hallelujah. Sing that along with me this morning. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Lord, you're mighty.
Worship the Lord for all that he has done. Worship the Lord for his goodness. Worship the Lord for his faithfulness. He is mighty. He is mighty. And we ought to give God a mighty praise, a mighty worship because he deserves it. God, we love you. We lift you. We adore you. We extol you, God. Jesus, put your hands together for God, how the Holy Spirit is working things out in your life. Hallelujah. You may take your seats in God's presence.
Good morning, Lighthouse. Good morning. It's good to see you guys here. Uh, we might as well just live it up because we don't know how much longer we're going to be able to meet. But let's just make the most of it today. Amen. Growing up, I used to watch television, and we had cable for like a whole month. <laughs> right? I don't know if it was because uh, my, my mom, the, the free trial gave, was over or that she saw the first bill. But she, we had cable for a whole month. And the only thing that I used to watch was cartoons, and there was another channel called MTV. I don't know if this still goes on right now, but MTV used to be called music television, where all you watched was music videos on that, on that station. And I don't know if you youngins know about that. We didn't have YouTube back then. So if you wanted to see a specific video, you had to sit there and wait. Sometimes there's a, like an 800 number you could call to request a video to play, but I, I was not allowed to use the phone. But you had to wait. And when your video show up, that's when you run up to the VCR and press record, and then you always miss like the first part of it. But still, you got the most of it. And that's how I learned most of my dance moves from those recorded VHSs that I, I think I still have. But, um, but growing up, I used to watch these videos, and there was one thing that I saw that I was missing from my outfit, my fit. Is that what the cool kids say right now? The fit or dripping? I, I saw I was missing a gold chain. And I was like, I need a gold chain. And I was saving my money to get myself a gold chain. And finally, in high school, I had enough money. My, I wanted to go to the store. I went to the mall to get that gold chain to accessorize my fit, to finish my fit, to complete my fit. I went there, and I, and I um, went to the jeweler, and I went to a whole bunch of jewelry spots in the mall, and... I realized that my vision did not match my budget. <laughs> what I wanted was up here, and what I had was, now I got to drop it down on the floor. <laughs> no, you know what? Kick it off the altar because that's too high, and then have somebody else pick it up and throw it away because that's what I had. All I could have afforded at that moment was, it wasn't even a chain. I can't even call it a chain. It was, it was one of those... Uh, no, not even a necklace. It, it, was, it, was a, it was like a gold dental floss. That's what it was. <laughs> like a gold dental floss that I could put around my neck, and it would hide between my necklines. And the only time you can see it is when I swallowed, right? <laughs> and I had to take it off quickly so that, because I felt a sneeze coming on, and I didn't want to have to pay for it. So I had to take it off and say, you know what? I, I, just, I just can't do it. On my way out of the mall, as fate may have it, I ran into, I bumped into a street entrepreneur, right? And I think he was just starting out because his, his products, they were way underpriced, way underpriced. And then I found one that I, exactly what I wanted, the gold chain, the one, not the ropes, but the, the, the chain links, yeah, those. I had one, I was like, yes, it's right in my budget, and I, I can haggle him down a little bit, and I did. And I still have money for bus fare to get home, but I had my gold chain. My gold chain, it finished my fit. Now, a few days later, I realized that I'm allergic to gold chains, all right, because I had, like, bumps coming up on my neck, 
and, and I had to get rid, I couldn't wear the gold chain anymore. Um, plus, you know, I didn't, I didn't like the gold chain anymore because it started turning to silver, because <laughs> as you know, gold fades into silver <laughs> over time. And I'm allergic to gold, so I don't, I don't wear that anymore. But some people might think it was fake. It wasn't, they didn't make fake gold back then. But, um, <laughs> which brings to my subject today. Today, our culture is overrun with fake products. Fake products. I've seen a Rolex that I thought cost $15,000. I saw an exact one. You couldn't even tell it apart. It was for $100. You know, it's hard to distinguish between fake and real. We have so many fake products around. People can improve their looks with fake nails, fake hair, fake teeth, fake body parts. I'm not going to say what body parts, but you get the drift. You can even get over here a taco, and it has fake meat in it with fake cheese. <laughs> You could get coffee with fake sugar inside of it. You can wear a, a fake designer outfit made out of fake leather and fake fur. You can even talk about fake news on social media with fake friends with your fake identity. <laughs> Fakeness is everywhere. There are some areas in life where fake works just fine. It works just as well as the real thing. But you know what? When it comes to faith, fake doesn't work. Amen. Real faith gives you access yeah. to the 6,000, over 6,000 promises in the Bible. Over 6,000. Fake faith can't give you access to that. Fake, fake, fake faith has no power to change your life. Fake faith has no power to save your life. Fake faith cannot answer your prayers. So if your prayers aren't being answered, you might need to check your faith. Fake faith cannot transform you. What you need is real faith. And in James chapter 2, in the second half, verses 14 through 20, or all the way to the end, we're going to talk, James is here, he's talking to us about the difference between fake faith and real faith. Now, reading this book of James, you might think that it contradicts with what another New Testament author, Paul, writes about. And it doesn't contradict it. James likes to talk about works, but Paul talked about faith. And, there's, and it complements each other. It doesn't contradict, but it complements. James had a different focus. Now, the difference between Paul and James and how they spoke about this faith, Paul emphasized on how to know I'm saved. He talked about how to know I'm saved. And there's a slide for that. His emphasis was how to know I'm, slave, I'm saved. But James talked about how to show I'm saved. That is what he emphasized, how to show I'm saved. Now, the focus for Paul was the root of my salvation. That is what is internal, what is unseen. That is the root of my salvation. You don't see the root of plants. You don't see the root of trees, but you know that it exists. James' focus was on the fruit of my salvation. That is what is external. That is what is visible. That is the fruit of your salvation. You can see the fruit of an apple tree. You can see the fruit of an orange tree. As far as works concerned, Paul talks about just keeping the Jewish laws and how that keeping the Jewish laws, you can keep them, but it's not what's going to save you. James' focus on works was just live like how Jesus lived. Live like Jesus because you are already a believer, so you must live like how Jesus lived. Now, in this passage, in this essay, 
and what James talks about. He distinguishes, he talks about how four things that are not faith, four things that are fake faith, and then he also gives two examples of what real faith looks like. So how do I know my faith is real? How do you know? James starts off in verse 14, and he says this. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. Moving on. Suppose you see your brother or sister who needs food or clothing, and you say to them, I wish you well. I feel for you. I hope you stay warm and eat well. But then you do nothing to meet their needs. What good does your sympathy do? It's worth nothing. In the same way, faith, if it is not accompanied by actions, doesn't work. It's dead and it's useless. Now, someone may argue, well, some people can have faith while other people do good deeds. But I say, I can't see your faith if I don't see any good works in you. I don't see good works to show for it. In contrast, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Now you say, well, I believe there is a God. And I say, well, good for you. But even the demons believe that. And they are afraid. They tremble. Tremble, they shudder. It's foolish not to realize that faith in God is useless if you don't do what God wants you to do. It's useless. And moving on, how do you know your faith is real? Again, there are four things that it's not. And later on, you're going to see that there are two things Two examples of what real faith looks like. In James chapter 2, verse 14, again, it reads, Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. So the first point is that real faith is more than just the words I say. Real faith is more than just words I say. Going back to verse 14, it says, what's the use of saying you have faith if you can't prove it by your actions? You can't just have like a memorized prayer that you pray at night. Oh, how does it go? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my soul and whatever. That's not going to cut it. That's not real faith. You can't just go about just repeating what you hear other people say with um, Christianese and the cliches and all of that. That is not what's going to give you real faith. You can't just claim to have faith neither. You can't just know, again, the religious lingo and, and all the right phrases to say. Like, have you met anyone like that? They know all the, don't, don't look at them. Just, just think about them. They know all the right things to say, but their lifestyle doesn't need it. They know what to say, but they don't act it. It doesn't match their words. You know that studies in America shows that most people claim Christianity. But then you have things like, the social injustice that's going on right now, their actions are not showing that. Because Christ-like, he loved all people. Racism, racism shouldn't be so high in America if most people claim Christianity. Racism is not Christ-like. Now, most of you guys are black here. No, wait. Yeah, most of you. And... There's, there's a such thing as, it's not called re reverse racism. No, it's, it's just racism. And when, when you think uh, a racist thoughts against white people, that's still racism. It's not reverse racism. It's not like, because I'm black, I can't be racist. No. <laughs> it's not Christ-like. 
Being a Christian, you should not see colors. Because in heaven, what is it going to look like? There's not just a black heaven and a white heaven and an Asian heaven. There's only one heaven. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Some people even make a mistake to, to claim that celebrities are Christians. Because they see them winning a world award and they say, I like to thank the man upstairs. You know, I think they're just talking about their producer. They're not, they're not talking about God because their lifestyle does not show that they are Christian. But again, real faith is more than words. Real faith is more than words. Jesus says it best in Matthew 7, verse 21. In the New Century Version, he says this. Not all those who say, you are our Lord. Not all those who say, you are my Lord. Not all those who say, you are my God. Will what? Enter the kingdom of heaven. The only people who will enter the kingdom of heaven are those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. It's not what you say. It's what you do. Have you ever seen you drive here in California? You know, we have really great drivers here. And have you ever seen like a driver just flips you off for something and then they cut right in front of you? And then you see a bumper sticker that says it's a Christian bumper sticker. Jesus is my co-pilot. Wow. Really? It's not just words. Now, I could claim to be the best dancer, right? Especially from those MTV videos that I have recorded and learning all those dance moves. I could claim to be the best singer, but after you see me sing or dance or try to do them both at the same time, you're gonna see that I'm not telling the truth. Real, real faith is more than just the words you say. Another thing that real faith, real faith is not is that real faith is more than an emotion I feel. Real faith is more than an emotion I feel. Some people can feel inspired through worship. Some people can feel like they've been through service and they were emotionally moved. Some people can feel like, oh, that gave me the chills. That gave me goosebumps. Some people could be like really emotional about service and still never have real faith. Yes, yes. James says it here in 15, verses 15 through 7, 17. He says this, suppose you see your brother or sister who needs food or clothing and you say to them, I wish you well. I feel for you. I'm very sympathetic for you. I'm very emotional for you right now. I hope you stay warm. I hope you can eat well. But then you do nothing to meet their needs. Can you see the sarcasm here? With James, James being sarcastic to those people who are all about the feels. I feel for you, but you don't do anything. It's not real faith. Right now, there are 32 million people who are out of work because of this pandemic that we are in. You can't just go to them and say, I feel for you. Let me pray for you. They need more than just that. What do they need? They need a job. They need you to help them. They need food sometimes. You can't just pray for them. They need more than just that. You can't just go to them and say, hey, buddy, I feel for you. And they need more than just prayer as well. I can't, if I'm outside and then I go to my car door and I accidentally shut the door on my finger, you can't come to me and say, you know what? I feel your pain. I, too, once shut my finger in a car door. I, too, know the pain that you are going through. No, real faith is practical. Open the door for me. Help me out. I'm in pain. That is what Jesus did. When people had needs, 
he met their needs before he gave them the gospel. When people were blind, he healed them. Then they were able to receive the gospel. The lame, he healed them. The sick, he healed them. He met their physical needs first before they were able to hear. We can't just preach the gospel to people. We have to heal their physical needs. We have to meet their physical needs before they can be open to say, why are you like this? What is this like? Can you explain to me why you are so kind? Then they'll be ready to receive the gospel. So real faith is more than just emotions that you feel. Real faith, the next one, is that it's more than an idea I debate. For some people, faith is just an intellectual game. It's like we like to get just debate. It's a mental challenge. It's a theology to be studied. It's a doctrine to be debated. It is a dogma to be defended. It is an idea to be discussed, a truth to be talked about. Let's just talk, 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 talk. That's all we want to do, just talk about the faith. Faith is not to them, it's not something that you do. Faith is just a conversation. Now we see here in the next few verses, no, in the next verse, verse 18, this is James guiding this phrase to this intellectual objector. Now someone may argue, isn't it possible that some people have good faith while other people do good deeds? This is just a talker. He just likes to talk about faith. Isn't it possible that some people could just talk about it? He goes on to say, but I say, no, I can't see your real faith if you don't do any real deeds to show me. In contrast, I can show you my faith by the good things I do. These people who just like to talk, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They just rather fight online. They just want to go on Facebook groups and just fight online and just chit chat about faith. They don't want to obey God. They just want to debate God. Don't, don't ask them to make any commitments. No, they're just committed to just talk. That's it. I don't want to do no action. I just want to talk about God. But if you look at, there's a key word in verse 18. That key word, James says, Show me. Show me. That means that faith has to be visible. You have to show me. Faith is like love. It is orderless, colorless, and weightless. But James says, show me. Don't just talk about it. Don't just have a debate about it. Don't just argue about it. Show me. My, my wife and some, one of my kids, they're going through this um, diet, and they want to count calories. You can't see calories. Just like faith, you can't see it, but you see the results of it. You see the results of it. Faith is like wind. You know it exists. You can't see it, but you can feel it. You can see the results of wind. Real faith is expressed in visible ways. James is here in verse 18 is saying, show me. Just like Missouri is known as the show me state. No, you have to show me. Prove it to me. James is saying, prove me that you are faithful. Prove it to me. Don't just say it. Don't just argue about it. Prove it to me. Just like how I can prove it to you with my actions. Somebody as big as God cannot possibly come into your life without changing you visibly. It can't. It's impossible for somebody as big as God to come into your life and then not change you in a visible way. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are new. The moment you accept Christ, 
You are not old anymore. What happens? The old has passed away. And behold, look, see, the new has come. Some people, it can be like an immediate change. Others, it may, it may be a process. You know, most people, it doesn't become new in your life overnight. And that's understandable. But it does become new in your life over time. There has to be a transition. There has to be a change. Because, again, someone as big as God, if he is in you, there has to be change. Amen. To Christians out there, you know, although we are, we're not, you know, persecuted here in America, you know, but we are harassed. You know, if, if you are arrested for being a Christian, I want to ask you, Will there be enough evidence to convict you? Will there be enough physical evidence for the lawyers and the prosecutors to convict you and keep you in jail? That is one question you should ask yourself if you have real faith. Real faith always produces a changed life. Now, real faith is more than a debate. Real faith is more than an emotion I feel. Real faith is more than words I say. The fourth thing that real faith is more than, it's more than a truth, I believe. It is more than just a truth. Now, in the next few verses, 19 and 20, James, you can really sense the sarcasm here. That's why I probably like James a lot because he, he's very sarcastic here. And it says this, now you say, well, I believe there is a God, and I say, good for you. But you know what? Even the demons believe that there is a God. They believe that, and they, too, are afraid. Next verse. It's foolish to not realize that faith in God is useless if you don't do what he wants you to do. You know, the devil is really smart. He's too smart to be an atheist. The devil believes in God. The devil believes in Jesus Christ. That's why he was out there trying to kill him. The devil believes. His demons believe that as well. But you know what? They're not going to see heaven. So it's not just a belief. Head knowledge is not enough. You have to obey God. Head knowledge is not enough. You have to love God. Head knowledge is not enough. You have to trust God. Head knowledge is not enough. You have to serve God. Head knowledge is not enough. So what is real faith if it's not what I say? What is real faith if it's not what I feel? What is real faith if it's not what I believe? What is real faith if it's not all of these things that I just want to argue about and I want to debate? So what is real faith? Real faith is something I do. Real faith is something you do. Faith is active. It's not passive. Faith is just not coming to church. No. Faith is a commitment. Faith is a choice. Faith is an action. Faith is something I do. James 2, going up, skipping over to verse 26, James says this, Just as a body without a spirit doesn't breathe and is dead, so faith that doesn't do anything is just as dead. Is your faith dead? You have to get up and just do it. Now, all these verses, there's all the verses that we went over, there's a key word that you can find in all of them. And that word, it's a two-letter word, and it's do. Do. Not no. Do. Some of the verses, it reads, if you do nothing, what good does your sympathy, sympathy do? Another one, what if you fail to do any real deeds? 
I show you my faith by what I do. Faith in God is useless if you don't do and he want what, what he wants you to do. Faith that doesn't do anything is dead. James is here, and I believe um, James, back then he wore Nikes because you have to just do it. Just do it. Faith shows up in my life. Faith needs to show up in your life. It needs to show up in your lifestyle. And if there's no change in my life, I don't have real faith. I've got fake faith. Change has to be there. If you're not doing anything, you might just have fake faith. 1 Corinthians 16 Verses 13 and 14, this is a very good verse to remember, especially for the pandemic that we are in right now, especially for the social injustice that we see. This is a very good verse for you to remember and memorize and have it into your heart where it says, stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. Stay brave. Be strong and do Some things in love. No, no. Do whatever you please. No, that's not what it says in that translation. No. And do everything in love. Everything has to be done in love. But first you have to stand firm in your faith. What are you doing to stand firm in your faith right now? What are you doing to take a stand for Jesus Christ? What are you doing to demonstrate your faith? What are you doing to demonstrate your faith in this pandemic that we are in right now? What are you doing to demonstrate your faith for the social injustice that we see right now going on? What are you doing? James went on in his essay to conclude his essay He gave two examples of people who showed real faith, a real active faith. Now, these two people, they're two very different people. One is named Abraham, and the other one is named Rahab. Now, neither of them were Jews at the moment. Neither of them. Now, Abraham, he had faith. Rahab had faith. Abraham, two different people again. Abraham was a man, is a man. Rahab is a woman. Abraham was a rich business success, a rich successful businessman. Rahab was a poor prostitute. But they had one thing in common. They had faith. Now, I said earlier that neither of them were Jews. And at the time, before Abraham was called by God, he was just an idol worshiper. As, there's a long line of people who were just idol worshipers in the era of Chaldeans. That's where he was born. And that's the modern-day Iraq right now. He wasn't even born in Israel. He was in modern-day Iraq. Now, Abraham was called to move by God. Pick up your things, get your family, get all of your stuff, and just move. And Abraham said, okay, I'll go. He doesn't know where he's going, when to stop. He hasn't been there before, but he says, I will go. Now, Abraham, in faith, Abraham followed God, not knowing where he was going. He didn't say, God, show me where we're going first. God, show me the end result of this. No, how will I know when I get there? God said, I will tell you when, but just go. He's going to a place he's never seen. He's going to a place he's never been before, but he was trusting in God. He trusted and he didn't even know God before, but he acted out in faith. God continued to test that faith by asking him to sacrifice his only son. The same son, that the same person that God asked, he said he was going to bless him if you followed me and have faith in me. I'm going to bless you and make you a father of many nations. 
And he had only one kid, and God asked him to sacrifice that one kid. To other people, that might not make sense. But to Abraham, he had faith, and he said, God, are you telling me to do this? I'm going to just do it. Just like Nike says, I'm going to just do it. His whole life was trusting in God. His whole life was about stepping out in faith, not knowing. Is your life like Abraham? Are you stepping out in faith, not knowing what the end result is going to be? Because if you know what is, what's going to happen, is that faith? No. Step out in faith. James 2, verse 22. I like how the message translation um, phrases it. And it says this. Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners? That faith expresses itself in works? That the works are works of faith? Works are works of faith. Verse 23 says, God accepted Abraham's faith. And that faith made him right with God. And Abraham was called God's friend. Are you God's friend? There are some friends in life that don't matter. But if you're God's friend, that's going to matter all the way into and through and for eternity. God wants to be your friend. But you know what? You've got to step across that line. You've got to step across that line into faith. And like Abraham did, you've got to just step in, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing where God is going to take you, not knowing, not caring if you've ever been there before, if you've never seen it or whatever, but you've got to step across that line and just move. And God is going to direct you. And in just a moment, if you've never stepped across that line, we're going to give you that opportunity to do just that. But let's talk about the other person that James talks about here. He talks about Rahab. Now, Rahab is a prostitute, a street walker in the street in the city of Jericho. And now this is, her story is found in Joshua chapter 2. If you want to go into that and read more about it, I'm just going to paraphrase it for you here. And Moses led the Israelites out of captivity for 400 years. And Jericho is a fortified city, huge walls. And it was not going to be easy for them to get into the city. So Joshua sent two spies to go in and investigate the city. Rahab knew of, of this, and she was terrified of the Israelites' God. And she did what she needed to do to, to, to protect these spies. Even if it was going to cost her life, she was more afraid of their God, the one true God, than what the city of Jericho can do to her. So in faith, Rahab risked her life to save others. She risked her life. And because she did that, God put her in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew. When God, when it says, the father begot this father, and father begot this son, and this father begot, 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 she was one of the begots. One of four women who was mentioned here. And Rahab isn't even a Jew. She was just a Gentile who was a prostitute. So here, we see here that no matter what your background is, God can use your life for good if you're just going to be like Rahab. Now, I'm not saying to be like a prostitute. I'm just talking about after what she did, not before, after what she did. Her faith was more important than her background. So it doesn't matter what you did before you got to know Christ. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what it is. God can use you. Paul is another example. When he was called Saul, he persecuted Christians. He killed Christians. But he became one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament. 
Most of his letters in the New Testament is from Paul. What did she do when she risked her life to save others? She showed her faith in action. She put her faith in action. What are you going to do? Are you going to risk your, your life of your, your pride? Are you going to risk that? Are you going to risk this, your life of um, not wanting to be embarrassed or not to be ashamed because you're not really risking your life in America to preach the gospel? Are you going to risk your comfortable life or are you going to step out of your comfort zone and kill yourself? Risk your life of comfortness to show faith in action. In the 1920s, there was this tight world world walker by the name of George Blondin is what he was called. In the 1920s, he, he was a master tightrope walker. And he, had a cha- he, put a, he gave himself a challenge to walk a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. And I don't know if any of you guys remember that. 1920s, anybody old enough to remember that? No? Okay. So let me explain it to you. So he walked the tightrope across, you know, the, from America side to the, the Canadian side. He walked that tightrope. And to the amazement of the crowd, when he got to the other side, everybody cheered and like, wow, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. You know, that's in the 1920s, so yeah. That was the greatest thing I've ever seen. And you know what George Rodden said? He said, you know what? I'm going to do it again. He turned around and walked that tightrope again. And he made it successfully. And everybody, again, the crowds, wow, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. That is amazing. He did it again. Everybody was cheering like, wow, woo. And you know what? He said, I'm going to do it again. But this time, I'm going to have a wheelbarrow. And he had a wheelbarrow, and he walked that tightrope. And when he got in the middle, he kind of wobbled a little bit. But he straightened himself out and walked all the way to the other side successfully. And everybody was just amazed at what they saw. There was a news reporter who came up to him. He was like, that was excellent. That was great. That was the best thing I've ever seen. I believe that you could do this a hundred times and not and just do it successfully. You could just keep going and just doing it. And everybody here believed just that. And George Blondin said, oh, you believe I could do it a hundred times? Like, yeah, yeah, you could do it. He said, okay. So he dumped out the wheelbarrow, filled the water, and he said, okay, hop on. Hop in. Let's go. Our behavior shows what we really believe. Are you willing to jump in the wheelbarrow of faith? If you know that Jesus is pushing that wheelbarrow, are you willing to just jump in that wheelbarrow and go across that tightrope across Niagara Falls? You can test yourself with this. You don't have to jump into a wheelbarrow to show it. But in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Are you truly in the faith? Maybe you've been a fake Christian. Maybe you've been a fake faith person. Maybe you've had a phony faith. Maybe you've talked the talk, but you haven't gotten in that wheelbarrow. There's nothing in your life that shows that you're really a Christian. Maybe you're just like everybody else who's a non-believer. No one can tell you apart. Have you stepped across that line? Have you jumped in the real barrel. If so, it ought to show up in your life right now. It doesn't matter that we're in the middle of a pandemic. It needs to show up right now. It doesn't matter that there is so social unrest right now, social injustice right now. It needs to show up right now. The faith that we have is not a convenient faith that we just store away and open it up on Sundays. It needs to show up 
right now. It needs to show up tomorrow. It needs to show up when you leave here in the parking lot. It needs to show up when you're in the grocery store. It needs to show up in your house. It needs to show up when you go to work. It needs to show up when you're driving down Gilman Springs. It needs to show up. Now, to be clear, works don't save you. To, to be clear, you can't work your way into heaven. You cannot earn your way into heaven. Works are not the root of your salvation. They're the fruit of it. They show that you are a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian. They just show it. Ephesians 2, 18, 8 through 10, it says this, for it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds or good works, which he has already prepared for us to do. In this verse, we see that there are three prepositions. One is that we are saved by grace. By grace. By is that preposition. Through is the next one. We're saved through faith. And the third one is for. We're saved for a life of good works. Do you have all three in your life? If you're saved by grace and you're saved through faith, it will show up through works in your life. You can't have God come into your life and it not change you. By grace through faith for a lifetime of good works. By grace through faith for a lifetime of good works. God has planned your life to make a difference. You have to make a difference. So to close here, I have some questions to ask of you. You don't have to answer it out loud. Just answer it in your heart. Truly answer it. Am I really a Christian after all? After hearing this message, am I really a Christian? Have I really put my faith in Christ? How do you know? I just said a few words. No, it, did it change your life? What changes can you point to in your life? What changes can people point to in your life? That is evidence of it. Is my lifestyle any different from unbelievers? Those are the questions to ask. Another one for you to ask, to put your faith into action, is what is your next step? What is my next next step for some of you your next step is to go talk to your neighbor about Christ to go talk to a relative about Jesus Christ to go talk to your co-worker your friends about Jesus that is your next step for others your next step is to start serving in church not to just come and be a spectator but to be a participator to come in and not say, what can this church do for me, but what can I do for this church? How can I contribute to Lighthouse? For some others, it might be to start coming into Bible study. We made it real easy for you. It's hard for us to we're make it easy for you. All you have to do is go to lighthousesj.church, look for Bible study, and zoom into Bible study. Turn on your camera, turn on your microphone, and you could participate in Bible study. For others, you could go to LighthouseSD.Church right now and click on events on the website and look for Class 201, Discovering My Spiritual Maturity, and register for that because that's happening today, 2 p.m., to learn more about the four habits of how to be more mature. Now, taking that class doesn't make you mature. It just gives you the tools for you to become more mature. 
Some, for others, it might be for you to wait for class one-on-one to show up so that you can be a member here at Lighthouse. Stepping over from being just a t- an attender to be a member of Lighthouse. For others, it might be to join a small group. Because that's where real fellowship happens. Over here on Sunday morning, you can't really have fellowship because right now I'm talking and you're just listening. That's not really fellowship. You know, you sit still while I instill. You know, it's not, that's not real fellowship. And also fellowship out there with the food and snacks, you're not really doing real fellowship. You're just saying hi, bye, goodbye, thank you, see you later next week. And that's not real fellowship. Smart group is where real fellowship takes place. And some, there might be somebody here today, their next step is to just be a Christian. To either recommit their lives to Christ or to commit for the very first time. And right now, you can just pray with me so that you can step across that line with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Pray with me. God, I don't want to have a fake faith. I want to really trust you. I want to change, and I want you to change my life for good. I don't want to just talk the talk and not walk the walk. I want my life to be better I want my life to be different I want my life to be what you made it to be I want you to know I want to know your purpose for my life and I'm asking you to change me change me I want to learn to trust you and to follow you like Abraham and like Rahab. Jesus Christ, guide me. Please guide me. I give my life completely to you. In your name, in your sweet It is all right praise god we thank you brother ace uh, for your labor uh, isn't god good hallelujah something for us to consider and and try to keep this at the forefront of your hearts and your minds faith without works is meaningless or is dead as james would would say or put it um if you're a christian today you're a christian by actions through the, the finished work of Jesus Christ. And if he has taken residence in you, it has provoked your steps to line up with what God wants us to do. Okay? Let's not be some phony, fake Christians. Let's, let's live what we say we believe and, and truly, genuinely go out there and impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are listening online, I want to give you an opportunity to, if, you want, if you'd like to give to Lighthouse, um, you can by texting 8423, and then it gives you the opportunity to give there. And for those of you that are here in the building, right here in the foyer, you can drop your, um, your offering in, in that box that says giving. Um, also, another thing to consider, if you're going to be joining us for Class 201 today, uh, I have something for you outside. I have some packets and things like that for you. Just to keep you um, well informed, it is a three-hour class, so I got snacks for those who are in the building. Sorry, y'all online. My bad. Can't do nothing about the snacks there. <laughs> With all hearts and minds clear, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's stand, um, and, and I'll pray, and we'll be released. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We bless you. We honor you. Your grace is better than life, and you have given it 
to your people. And so while um, we know that the gospel is being preached, I pray for that one that heard your word today and is saying in their hearts, what must I do to be saved? Lord, would you uh, permeate with your presence that heart, that mind of that individual, that they might be able to, to, to put down their old nature and pick up the new nature of salvation. Lord, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice as they're making their way home or the ones that may already be at home. Would you give them perfect peace and would you carry them until we meet again? Father, we love you and we thank you. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, just one other thing as I thought about it, Bible study, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, Zoom, very easy for you, so you don't have to physically go to a, um, to a building, just go to lighthouse.sj.church, and we can get it done from there. Amen? You are released. Enjoy your week.
Jumped up from the floor to the middle You think I want the credit, I don't Cause the glory ain't made for me, no I know who sits on the throne Who makes the stage and writes the songs And I know I couldn't do this all my own Truth is, I'm not lucky, I'm lucky. 